we are what we can grow and we serve that. So I, I do try to plan ahead, but there's also like, you, you have to um, be pretty agile in, in what you can make and, and what dishes you can visualize because your harvest doesn't uh, exactly match what you've planted. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Timing, as they say, is everything. Fleeting, spur-of-the-moment decisions can sometimes, ultimately, be life-changing for the better. They can be moments that change paths, that create opportunities, and a better life too. Joey Ingram is a head chef at Margan Family Wines and Restaurant in the Hunter Valley. Joey, how are you? I'm great, Hux. Yeah, I'm uh, very happy. You uh, rolled the dice and left the city um, in the middle of the bushfires, but found yourself away from something um, that affected the whole planet, the pandemic, um, for a period of time. What was that like, making that transition out of the city and then the pandemic landing? Oh, look, I mean, it was. it felt for us like it was a huge risk uh, at the time. Um, about early 2017, my parents-in-law bought a, um, hundred acre property in Bulga, which is, uh, just at the foothills of the Wallamai National Park in the Lower Hunter. And, um, we were, uh, very happily visiting every, just about every weekend, every second weekend. Um, you know, it was about two and a half hours door to door. So we, w- we would jet up to Bulga at every opportunity that we could. And, um, it, uh, yeah, it, it was always the drive back for us that where, where we thought, oh, geez, you know, we'd be driving back to the, to the inner West and going through all that construction on Victoria road and the Glebe Island bridge and you know, complaining about it. And, and we got to a point where we, we thought, well, pretty soon we're going to have to put up or shut up and, um, and stop the whinging and do something about it. And, um, we had, we had always spoken about maybe doing something down the South coast because, um, you know, I spent most of my childhood down at Naruma and I was always keen to do something down there. And, uh, it, it didn't seem like it was on the cards because uh, we just had our first child and we had a really good support network of of people all around. Both sets of parents were close and, um, you know, all my close mates and, and my wife Maddie, her close mates, kind of had kids the same age. So we, we felt like we were in a really good position. Um, and one day I got a rec- call from a recruiter um to see if I knew anybody that was that was interested in talking about a tree change role, and I, I kind of just chatted to the bloke, and he um, he explained what the role was and said that it was in Broke, uh, and I instantly knew where where it was if it was in Broke, um, and Margan where where the main the main sort of restaurant there, um, and so over the course of probably a month or so. Uh, I mean, it, it started. It started when I spoke to the recruiter, and he said, uh, "Lisa Margan happens to be in Sydney at the moment. Would you be available to go and meet her for for a chat?" So I did, and um, and we ended up just sitting down in the the lobby of a hotel and talking for a couple of hours, and and um, it was just talk, just just general shop talk. You know, she's she was just so easy to talk to, and so interested in my path so far and she invited me to come visit the restaurant uh the the next time that I was up which was only a fortnight later uh and so this is this is we're talking November 2019 so the the fires were were really blazing they they were really kicking off then and it it never looked so serious as as it had then um, and so we went up at, at Christmas time as we do each year and I, I ventured out to Broke and, and met Lisa and then um, had a walk around and then met Andrew Margan and, and we sort of had a, another informal interview. And from from there we, we just kind of 
uh, really clicked in, in terms of our, our values and ethos and uh, definitely cooking style. Uh, and they offered me the position and I accepted on the spot and they, they said, I did want to talk to your wife about it. Um, and, and we had already spoken, uh, Maddie and I about it and we kind of started getting a little bit excited about the, the prospect of a, what's called a tree change or a bush, bush change. Um, and so I accepted and, and that was it. And so they just kind of said, well, you know, l work out your notice period and, and let us know what you need for moving. Um, so we put all of our worldly belongings into a shipping container and um, packed up on, on Australia Day 2020 and um, drove up to the belly of the beast. And everything was on fire, as I said, and... Um, Every, this is coming off four or five years of, of, of drought, uh, prob probably th the last three really extreme drought. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, yeah, we, we felt like it was a bit of a gamble, but w we had never done a big gamble like that. We've always kind of been reasonably um, intelligent, <laughs> I, I guess about our, our decision makings, you know, um, we, we like to weigh up pros and cons of, of, of all things. Um, you know, never quit a job on the whim and never, yeah. So we, we felt like if we're going to make, <clears throat> if we're going to make a, a big life changing move, we still did it with a little bit of safety in the sense that it's, it's only two hours from Sydney. Um, and then those rains in February came um, put the fires out and, um, yeah, away we went. It was, life was good. After that initial sort of stepping into the fire and moving your young family at that time, how did you feel when the pandemic landed being away from the cities? Well, we, I had, um, seven weekends trading as the head chef before we were, um, closed and stood down. Um, now a lot of people, uh, probably that know me will, will probably know that, you know, I don't take the answer no very easily, but, um, so I, I just kind of kept coming and kept coming back each day. And, um, yeah, we, we were stood down as the, as the pandemic sort of gained momentum in those, those early weeks of February and, and March, we could see the, the numbers, uh, growing and, it was from where my family property is, is about a 20 minute lovely drive through, um, through Milbrodale into Broke. And so I would listen to ABC news every morning on the radio. And it, it was honestly like something out of a, like a zombie flick, you know, it was like Paris has fallen, you know, and, um, you know, Cairo has been taken and, it, it was, it was really, um, world's end kind of vibe that we were getting. And, um, we, uh, had very, as, as everybody did, we had very little, um, metrics to base anything off. Uh, what we did know was that visitation to the Hunter Valley was already very low because of the bushfires. So that was, that made it very hard for us to quantify um, the the decline in covers for us, uh, and also with me having just started, I, I had no nothing to compare it to. I, I had spreadsheets that I could look at from the previous years, but that that didn't take into account the bushfires. So um, when the when the shutdown happened, um, we had obviously big fridges full of stock and. Um, you know, uh, we, we've got a, a hectare of um, working garden that, that fuels the restaurant there, um, which was just, just coming into autumn, you know. So so all the, this lovely produce, you know, no, nobody told the quinces that we're closed, you know. So, so we just had all these trees fruiting and, and lovely, you know, parsnips poking their heads up and there's – there was um, this big frantic panic of what to do initially with all this produce. Do we lay beds down and put them to sleep? Do we, do we keep it going? Do we rip everything out and sell it in produce boxes? We didn't know. So we, um, 
yeah, we had this big staff meeting and, and a clean down. Um, and I drove, drove back to the farm that night and, um, you know, my father-in-law, Dom, uh, wrapped his arms around me and said, we've, we've got your backs, lad. Um, you know, which, uh, it's going to bring me to tears now, but it was, it was just, we, we felt instantly safe <clears throat> and there was, there was that comforting emotional safeness, uh, that we felt, but there was also the fact that we got to put the cattle gate up at the front of the property, um, you know, measure how much diesel we had, count how much ammunition we had. And that was it. We were, we were ready. You know, we, we slaughtered a cow and put it in the freezer, uh, in cuts, obviously not the whole cow, but, um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we kind of felt, we felt really blessed, um, and, and ready for, to, to just weigh it out, wait it out. Um, down the back of our property, uh, it, so it, it backs onto the Wollamai National Park. So it doesn't really have any neighbors per se. You just kind of go down and then the bush starts and down there, uh, because of the February rains, this massive Creek, um, started running. So we had this beautiful fresh water stream coming through and it was still balmy and warm. And we would, we would walk down through the paddocks, through the cows, see the kangaroos, through the vineyard and have a, have a splash around in the Creek. And we were like, Oh, so this is what isolation feels like, you know? So, so we really, um, we really tried to, to just remain positive and, and happy and, you know, ha happiness is said that it's, it's nothing more than the absence of pain. And, and we, we, um, we didn't feel any pain through that. So we were really fortunate, you know, um, we, we felt good. We felt motivated every day to get up and have walks and garden and potter around. And as I said, I was going back to mug and just kind of familiarizing myself with with the kitchen, with the produce, getting to know my, my colleagues in other departments. Like, um, you know, we're, we're a very varied and diverse business with, um, a hundred hectares of, of very distinguished grapevines and a, and an onsite, you know, full, full on working winery. So it was the, only the, the, um, restaurant and the cellar door that was closed. But in terms of the other, um, crew that work for Margins, you know, everybody in the winery was still there. All the vineyard boys were still there. Everybody in the warehouses and the sales was, it was all still pumping. So we, um, yeah, I, I got a good opportunity to, to kind of be there and just get to know everybody. And then I, I started saying, well, you know, we'll go all this basil. Why don't I just make some gnocchi and sell some pesto and we'll do some meal boxes. So we started doing that and then that continued. And, and, um, that was when, so I don't know that it was like hard lockdown. I, I guess there was, you were allowed to still go out and buy alcohol. And so our cellar door was allowed to trade for sales only, but no tastings. So because of that, we closed it to sales only on Saturdays and we established like a little market market. So we'd just start baking focaccias and baking English muffins and, burger buns and it, seeming seemingly all all the stuff that was being sold out of the the supermarkets we we were trying trying to make and and sell except for the the dunny paper but plenty of leaves around so yeah look it it was a, a, a really um quite an introspective time because we we didn't know what to do but we knew that there were people far, far worse off. And so we shouldn't be too down in the dumps about it. The Hunter Valley ended up opening up and welcoming back a, a flock of, of tourists as um, society opened up again last year. What was it like for you running the kitchen there with, with so many people um, keen to get out of the city because of what they'd experienced? Oh, it was immense. I mean, I, I, I'd come from, you know, my past sort of 19 years cooking in Sydney. So, a busy, a busy restaurant was something that I'm very familiar with. It was that the, the, the greatest advantage I found was that when we reopened, we um, changed the offering and the concept to a, a garden tasting menu only. Whereas before we had a, 
you know, a, an a la carte menu, choice of five entrees, five mains, four desserts. We had a Dago menu and we had a sharing sort of family style menu. So the amount of, of prep and garden produce that was being used was immense. Um, and that was always from the, that was going to be my biggest challenge is figure out, you know, how and where I can use all this produce and keep up to date with the planting schedule. Um, but n since, since reopening on that, um, Queen's birthday long weekend in 2020 June, we were able to figure out that we do, uh, 280 covers across the weekend. We only trade Friday, Saturday, Sunday every week. Uh, and so we were able to do 280 covers and that meant that I could speak to our full-time gardeners and, and kind of say, I, I need 280 portions of this and show them what a portion is. Might be a baby, you know, zucchini flower. So we need female plants. I need 280 flowers per weekend. And so it allows us to, to really use that garden and really push that garden hard um, and, and have a a fantastic sort of uh, roster of what's being planted in what beds and what our yields are going to be. And, and since then we've honed that um, system down even more uh, to where we are now. Uh, obviously now we're back to, <laughs> back to square one, but um, yeah, look, I've, I, I thought, I thought that it was a, a really, um, uh, uh, it wasn't particularly trying for me in, in terms of um, w what my skill set would allow me to do. It was, it was more that I had this new team um, around me that I'd only ever worked for with for seven weeks, uh, and I was very much at at that stage still. I, I you know I didn't come in guns blazing. And go right, that's that's off. That's off. Here's my signature. Blah blah. blah you know. I kind of wanted to, to sort of get the lie of the land and see how the guys work, work out who's strong, who's weak, who's, who needs coaching, who can, who can take it if you chuck them a bollocking. Um, so starting with that new team, I was able to go Dego only in this, in, with, with a Dego board, the same style as, um, that was used at Tetsuya's and, I can sort of see the whole dining room as a, a grid beside me and I, I can know who's on what and where. So it, it was really um, empowering to, um, to put forward this um, style of service uh, and be able to execute it, you know, really strongly. Um, and that, that really helped, helped me um, sort of form my team. All the all those guys that were currently working there, they they all sort of finished up after the pandemic, and and we recruited new new staff, and and so I had this green team that didn't know me, I didn't know them, and we just kind of had to do that really quick <laughs> get get to get to become best friends and go, you know, become best friends now. And so it's, it's, it was really quite hard, but it was also, um, it was also a clean slate kind of situation. So it was, it was really positive, the whole experience. Um, you know, I got nothing but support from, from Lisa and Andrew, um, and the rest of the Margan family and, and what, what we were doing, um, and to what standards we were doing it. And the guests loved it. We were able to flip services and, you know, we, we could do, uh, 70 people for lunch using the staff that we would need for 35. Cause we just get them in and flip them and do a two o'clock sitting and flip that and do a dinner sitting as well. So yeah, we got, we got, um, we got very good very quickly. Yeah. Take us back to when you were young, you said you grew up on the South coast. When, when did food, uh, and a, and a career in food start to be of interest to you? Uh, look, I mean, I was I was a pretty lucky kid growing up. My my dad was quite fond of a cafe, quite fond of a restaurant. Um, 
I thought I personally thought that that cafes or and, and restaurants were just the greatest thing in the world. Like people, somebody gives you this piece of paper, and you can choose anything off it, and they just bring it. You know, I I, lo- I loved cafes and loved going out. I loved um, you know I had a like a tenth birthday party at Planet Hollywood. Um, I remember being obsessed with Laksa when I was twelve and. And, I, you know, for my birthday meal, I wanted to go to Sussex Street Food Court to get Luxor and then go down to, do you remember there was that like games place underneath called Matilda's? I wanted to go and play the pinball down at Matilda's after having a big Luxor when I was 12. So it was a, it was a big, it was a big thing for, for us, um, food. My, my mum was, was really interested in, um, Asian cuisine. She's a English as a second language teacher, um, out at Cabramatta in the seventies when, when the first, um, sort of big influx of Vietnamese migrants came. And so she developed this real fondness for, um, Southeast Asian food and flavors. And so we would, we would often go out to Cabra for a fur, um, going to definitely into Chinatown and Dixon street and family yum chars family yum chars was huge you know like my my dad and mum are from big families and um my dad and his brothers would always feud over like my uncle loved the yum char at golden century rest in peace and my dad was a big fan of uh marigold um and there was always a rivalry and then you know someone else would throw their hat in the ring go let's go up to the regal on you know on um liverpool street uh, and so there was there was always a big it was either a big family yum cha on a sunday or it was round at my nan and granddad's house and there was it was a sort of a potluck bring you bring your plate sort of thing but yeah i um i grew up in sydney and and spent just about every uh holiday down at naruma because that's where my mum had grown up and we had the family house down there so i always uh, ate oysters and and fish and uh, I ate oysters from a very young age. I remember my dad's favorite oyster preparation was called oyster czarina, as, as in the, you know, the princess of the czar. I don't even know if it was real, but it's basically like red caviar at one side of the oyster, black caviar at the other, and a dollop of sour cream in the middle. And it is amazing. Like using that cheap lump fish roe from the supermarkets, I just thought that I was... I was just the queen of Sheba eating those things. I loved them so much. And, you know, the first thing that I fed my son, the first solid thing was an oyster. I mean, not solid. I chopped it up. But that was his first food that he ate. So I, I kind of like to I, – I thought I'd go out on a limb and go, yeah, shellfish first. Let's test him. But, um, <clears throat> you know, that was, that was a big part of my life, oysters and yabby pumping on one side of Naruma and then going – out the back to to catch the whiting in the Arvo with the same yabbies and yeah it was I just have huge a huge amount of like really really positive and fond memories of food you know one one that's probably more suited um, to where you are now is that we used dad and I used to drive down to the Phillip Island Grand Prix once a year. And we'd stop in Canberra and there was a place, I don't know if it's still there, um, near Civic called Gus's Cafe. And they used to serve uh, soft boiled eggs with toast soldiers and a little ramekin of caviar as the, as the dipper. And that was, that was like, you know, mind blowing for me that, that you could just put those two things together, you know, like you, I'd only... I, I, I sound like I sound like a real prick saying it, but I only thought that oysters went with caviar, you know. <laughs> and now, then I realised that you could have caviar with everything. But yeah, I, I guess those memories, like the mem- memories, are. Uh, it's been said by far greater chefs than I, but memories are, are, are such a powerful tool, aren't they? You know, I remember just the taste of those shitty jam donuts on Phillip Island at the, at the motorcycle Grand Prix. You know, I, I really, I have a, you know, my mum's five spice chicken wings are probably my death row meal. Like I, I just remember, 
you know, like they were just bunged into the crock pot with soy sauce and ginger star anise and a bit of um, water and five spice powder. But that jelly that, that sets when they're left over, I remember like racing to the fridge the next day to eat that chicken jelly that's at the bottom of the container. So, um, so yeah, they were always, a, food was always huge for me um, growing up. And we had, I had a, a large family, lots of cousins. And so we'd, we'd go down to Naruma and, um, you know, the cousins, all the kids had to do the washing up. And I remember saying to mum one day, like, why, you know, I want to go outside and play cricket after dinner. Why, why can't we do that? And she said, well, we cooked. The grown-ups cook, so you guys wash up. So I said, you know, this is the son of a lawyer, so I tried to bargain my way out of it. And I was like, well, what do I need to do to... <laughs> to get out of doing that. And she said, well, make something. So I, I got the CWA cookbook and I started making tartar sauce and Mari Rose sauce and, uh, you know, little potato salads. And I didn't do the scones. Most people that pick up a CWA cookbook go for the scones, but I didn't do the scones. I was more savory. Um, and I remember, um, like it, it was a recipe for the mayonnaise, which was the base recipe for the Mari Rose sauce. And you made it and I made it. And it looked, it looked nothing like the cocktail sauce that they sold in the fish and chip shop. And I couldn't figure out why, like why wasn't it glossy? And so I bought some mayonnaise and made the sauce with store-bought mayonnaise and boom, it was glossy and shiny and it looked like the thing that they charge a buck for on top of your fish and chips. And so that was it. I, that was it. We didn't buy condiments again, you know, from the, from the fish and chip shop. It was, it was, I would make all that. And so I, yeah, I, I got out of, um, I got out of doing the washing up. Um, and you know, it's just starting young. I, I kind of gravitated towards food. Um, you know, I was unknowingly preparing myself for a somewhat uh, calamitous entry to restaurant life. Well, you've worked for some pretty incredible uh, operators. Uh, what have been the main influences through your career? Um, look, I mean, so many, really, at different stages. And you realise when you get older, like, how, who, who you met at the right time. You know, so I was like, I was really into skating and, and graffiti uh, in the late nineties. And I kind of, I got busted by this, this dude that owned a cafe, uh, in the shops near where I, I lived. And, um, we jumped, me and my mates had jumped up onto the awnings above the bus stop and we were, we were graffitiing up there and we jumped down and this guy that was out for a night run, he grabbed me and he said, I know, I know who you are. I know, I see your mum. I know your mum. I know where you go to school, you know? So he said, you, you have, I'm going to call the police and call your mother and call your school unless you come to the cafe tomorrow at 6am. And so I went to the cafe at 6am and there's just this mountain boxes and boxes of oranges that I had to peel for their fresh juice. And then, um, you know, they blanch all the tomatoes and then just give them to me in the ice water and I had to peel them for concas. And, he, he made me do that for four weekends, four weekends running in uh, year nine. And then on the fifth weekend, he, um, he said next weekend, cause, cause every weekend I said, okay, uh, I'll see you later. And he goes back at six tomorrow. Otherwise I'll tell your mum. And so I went back and then on the fourth weekend, he said, next weekend you can come at 7am and uh, I'm going to start paying you $8 an hour. So I started making sandwiches, you know, you'd make all the paninis, you'd try to get ahead on them and, and just be serving paninis all day. It was a very, very busy, popular local cafe. And then, you know, I'd work the sandwiches and they moved me into the kitchen and you get to go on, you know, just cook bacon, just more bacon, more bacon, sausages, tomatoes on the griddle. And then you'd move to maybe the pasta section the the primo section was eggs if you could um, the only the one chef did eggs all the poached and scrambled eggs and um yeah that that was so i was i was cooking every weekend during year 9 and 10 um so it seemed pretty natural for me to take that as a subject in year 10 
Now, where I went to school at Mossman High, we had um, commercial kitchens in the in the school. So the hospitality class was just once a week on a Wednesday after school. I think the class started at like 3.30 and went till 6.30. And so I could just jig that and go into class and pass um, pass the exams because I could already kind of prep a little bit. Um, so because I jigged so much, um, I was considered ineligible for the work placement uh, in a commercial kitchen, which was a module of the course needed for completion. So I failed hospitality. Uh, so my choice was either do an extra two units in year 11 or repeat year 10. So I thought it's probably going to be easier for me to just become an apprentice chef. So I, I did. I, I just did that. Um, and, and I just became obsessed with like French, French food, French cooking. My mum had this, um, Escoffier book called chef of Kings, King of chefs. And yeah, French culture for me was just, was just huge. So I started my apprenticeship at the bathers pavilion and I was really obsessed with French culture and food. I thought I'd marry a French girl. I was into, I look back all my you know, early notebooks, like a wanker, I'd written everything in French. So now, now I look back and try to find this old recipe and I'm like, oh, fuck, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, so I, I started planning on when to, when to go to France. And so I've traveled with a Dutch friend and we went, um, we went to Holland and, um, I ended up sort of running dry with, with cash, um, and I knew a waiter that had worked at the bathers and he was back in Paris. So I, I called him and um, he got me a job just prepping seafoods at a, at a one star called Le Dom. Um, so coming back with like, you know, on paper, a bit of start experience. Like I was, I was three years into my apprenticeship. So I, I didn't know what I was looking at. I wasn't, it wasn't like go over to Paris and learn from the best. I, I went to Paris and I needed a job. So I, I got one, but I came back and, and went to Tetsuya's. Um, and that was, uh, you know, that was, that was a slap in the face really with the biggest, the, the highest of quality of everything, big brigade, big events, total immersion into fine dining, um, and, and I stayed there for two and a half years, um, and got to work on most of the sections there. Um, and one of those, uh, one of those times when somebody leaves and you do a whip round and get them a cookbook, you know, I was my turn to go up to Kinakunya and get the cookbook for whoever was leaving. And, um, and I came across the St. John nose to tail, a British kind of way of eating and, I just became obsessed with this book. So I cooked every recipe out of that first you no know, tail book and just made it this mission. Many of them I put in my staff meal. You had to do staff meal once a week at, or once a fortnight at Tets because of the size of the brigade. You, you, your roster came around every two weeks. So I tried to incorporate something from there. Obviously I couldn't, uh, I couldn't serve, you know, tripe for 60 to, to this, to the staff there, it still had to be palatable. I mean, you know, uh, enjoyable for, for everybody, not just a shock experience, but I wanted to do the silk purse pig's ear, uh, you know, the stuffed with, I think it's stuffed with like cottachino sausage and bread soaked in milk and ricotta and nutmeg. And it was kind of this, um, you yeah, know, silk purse that was crumbed. And I remember uh, commenting, like trying to order pig's ears. And, um, Martin, Ben said that Kempy probably ordered them all. And so I, I didn't know who this was. So, um, so yeah, I looked up restaurant Balzac and, and I took a week of annual leave and went to do a trial at Balzac and I, I did a three day trial and I, I was pretty hooked, I guess, from the, from the first, um, the first moment in the kitchen there with Matt, um, you know, it, that was kind of more hardcore really. Like Tets was, Tets was hard and, and gruelling and hard work, but 
but those those Franglish kitchens of the early 2000s like they they were hard men like they were abusive and pressurized and and they separated the men from the boys really quickly those places uh, and that's what I was really into um, and one of the first jobs I remember on the trial was was prepping this tiny baby Hawkesbury squid that was probably the size of your, half your thumb and it was tiny and I had this massive bloody bucket of it and that was my job that was the job for the dude on the trial was clean this so we cleaned him you know took the skin off and tentacles removed and then the tentacles got minced with scallop and piped back inside the the squid and then it was flour fried and put on a rosemary skewer above like a fennel bisque or something and that was the amuse like all that all that was to give them this tiny little bite on the first course. And I thought, whoa, like this, this is my chef, you know? Like I remember, I remember just like from that trial, there was, there was this dish on that was like a whole flat pork belly that was stuffed with boudin noir and sweetbreads and then confit and pressed and caramelized. And it had a braised pig's tail on it and a, uh, and a sauce and I think there was like little tiny apple sofrino balls and baby radishes in the sauce and it just blew my mind just this kind of huge cooking but it was such a deft touch you know even just seeing seeing they did a, a well done beef got ordered and like normally when you've got carved sirloin or or scotch or whatever on the menu you'll keep those end bits you know for keep for well done's so th th this wasn't done. Like this was at Balzac. Somebody ordered well done beef. So this perfect slab of beef was carved off this and then it was put into just a pan by itself and foamed with butter, garlic, thyme, bay, you know, and you would foam and nappe this, this well done steak, like with all the love that you would put into, you know, a piece of fish. And, and I just thought this is it. This, this is for me. So I did my three days and Matt offered me the job. Um, and I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. And he goes, you got to start Tuesday. Uh, and I said, no, I, I can't. I, um, I got to give notice. I, Tets needs a month notice. You know, that was drilled into everybody that you don't leave with less than a month notice. And he was like, well, sorry, mate. You know, I'll see you later then. And so... <laughs> So I said, well, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't take it then. So after that, I was kind of packing up. I was real down and depressed and he came in and kind of winked at me and goes, sort your notice out, mate, and just let me know when you can start. So it was a kind of a, you know, kind of a test. But Balzac was everything. Like Matt, Matt was, Matt is my chef. You know, he, he taught me, he taught me the most um, about like the kit, like the kitchen. Yeah, that was that was it. Matt taught you everything. And he taught us as a team, you know, like a, about not just, not just to meet your food cost, but to fucking eviscerate it, you know, like how low can you get it? And everybody thinks, you know, Kempe's tight as a duck's ass, but you know, he, you could see, you could see what he was doing that, what the reason was, why, because, you know, little Josh would come back with a van full of mushrooms and Kempe had dropped three grand on mushrooms, just, just like that. And you could see, well, that's, that's why, that's why we're, that's why we're saving. That's what we're saving for. So yeah, Matt, Matt is just the chef's chef, like breaking down pigs or peeling sweetbreads or, or trimming a strawberry, you know, filleting rouge is all the same concentration so i just gave everything i just gave everything to that place you know I, I get taken to the big events of off site and the private dinners that he'd do and yeah it was it was just um i got made um junior sous chef there after a couple of months uh and you know they he he really um, drilled it into me that I, you know, I wasn't there to be a screamer. Like I was the guy in the trenches with the other guys. So if there was a problem, the the other guys should come to me first rather, you know, before the head chef or sous chef finds out. So I was, I was constantly reminded of my junior status, but also I, I was just given so much, um, 
so much uh yeah ad- advice and and cur- encouragement um but yeah matt is matt's the guy for me he um he just retaught me how to cook and you know he's he's one of my best mates like we 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 talk a lot together our our wives are friends our our kids are friends and we holiday together sometimes and you know he just he just became my mentor but like I remember once at at the Taste of Sydney, he he was, um, you know, talking talking to Dietmar, who he'd worked for at Forty One, and and he he'd mentioned to me that, you know, he'll always be chef to me. He was he'd just call him chef, and and I I feel like that, you know, I, I really that really resonated with me, and I feel like I still text him and say, hey chef, how you going? And then it's it's like it's gone past that, but but. It, he he was the he was the guy for me you know he set he set me on this cooking path that was really um intuitive and and really um it knowing about the product meant meant everything i think that's what well I mean. tell us about your cooking style and where you're at at the moment well so my yeah my my cooking style is a um an amalgamation, I guess, of, of, of all the best things I've ever learned. So where I am is um, at Margan. So we, as I've said, we have a, a um, hectare of garden there. Um, we trade for the three weekend days. So Friday lunch, dinner, Saturday lunch, dinner, Sunday lunch. That's our five services for the week. Um, and we've spoken about how we moved to tasting menu Um so my my food style is is rather rather simple. I mean, I try to over deliver. Um, obviously, like most most people want to, they want to give the best that they can. But um, yeah, I, I think I've become a bit of a vegetable snob after like the the eating of the like the margin veggies for so long now, or, or a year now. You know, more than a year now. But I, you know, I. I'll go out somewhere else and, and eat somewhere, you know, up in Newey or whatever. And you're like, yeah, that's, I mean, it's nice, but it's not a beetroot, is it? Like it's, yeah. So, so my, my, st- my style is, is obviously very seasonal. Uh, it has to be, that's, that kind of doesn't even get mentioned really, or it shouldn't like we are what we can grow and we serve that. So I, I do try to plan ahead, but, there's also like, you ha- you have to um, be pretty agile in in what you can make and and what dishes you can visualize because your harvest doesn't uh, exactly match what you've planted. If that makes sense, well, you don't always know what you what you're going to pull out of the ground, um, and so you have to think on the run a lot. Like this year, for example, just. Um, one off you know our we had such a wet summer so our tomatoes just got all caned by by rising rot because there was you know there was just more rain than they they're used to having so from what i thought i was going to be harvesting in in lovely red tomatoes uh we could see rot climbing up the vine and so uh, okay well we have to do something with green tomatoes because they're all coming off. They're all coming off the vine now, and so you know we were juicing them and putting them in sorbets and you know emulsifying the juice. We were obviously you know all the all the regulars fried green tomatoes and green tomato relish and salted tomatoes and and all that. Like we've still got them kicking about in the cool room in preserves and purees and stuff. But yeah, I mean <clears throat> yeah. You have to be very flexible when when you're growing stuff because you you don't always know what it's going to be like and and having come from uh, you know a, a rather fine dining background, you're used to sourcing the perfect red Whitloff or the best Jerusalem artichoke. Now they look lovely, but they got nothing on the flavour of our artichokes that we grow but our artichokes just look horrible like they taste they taste amazing but they are such a pain to clean up you know like they're knobbly and 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 just sweet and nutty and gorgeous and so you've you've really got to go okay 
that's not what I imagined. Uh, so what can I do with this? So yeah, look, my, my, my cooking style is obviously, uh, influenced by, um, French mainly, uh, Mediterranean kind of, uh, flavor combinations, definitely, uh, elements of Japanese, uh, influence in there. Um, but at the moment, I mean, my, my cooking style is, is what I can get from the garden. So I have to be very, um, I have to be very flexible of what I want to put on the plate and I have to be ready for that to change the week before, but we've got a lovely, you know, a lovely dining room and on a Sunday, you know, it, it's, it's one of the most peaceful things I do is, you know, I grab a, a, grab a nice chair from the dining room, drag it out to the garden. Well, well, there's a bit of a clean down happening and I sit in the garden with a notebook and I just kind of write the menu for next Thursday of what we're going to be prepping. And that seems to be kind of the best way to guarantee unless, you know, we get a hailstorm Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday. But, but that for me is, is how I, um, is how I write the menus. I obviously have a rough idea, but yeah, as I said, like my, my cooking style is, is, um, is assimilating and amalgamating now with a Margan style, which is, whatever it is, if we can grow it, we can serve it, you know, like we, we, we grow a lot of, a lot of lemongrass, you know, for our, um, Argan vermouth. So we're not an Asian restaurant by any means, but I, I can grow lemongrass. So, you know, lemongrass goes in lobster bisques or we can, um, you know, we grow turmeric because it's really, um, great for the soil health. And so, I have turmeric, so we we put that in some things. It, it's it's not overly defining of the cuisine, but you know if it can if we can grow it, we can serve it. So yeah, it, it really it's it's a feeling of of freedom. You know, it's it's really it's a really free way of cooking, and I think it's great for my my team. I got two apprentices, a um, you know a sort of commie junior chef to party and a, and a sous chef. And so it, it's, I think it's great for them to, to not be cooking from books so much of like, okay, eat this now, eat it again. Now cut it and leave it in the fridge overnight and eat it tomorrow. And let's try it steamed. Let's try it poached. Let's try it sauteed. And so it, you kind of, you kind of just have to have to do that because uh, you, you can't just do the same thing with it as well. Like I know now that we're, we've got asparagus starting now give uh, that we've had the last frost up here. So asparagus is give it, give it six days, seven days. And we're going to be getting five or 600 spears out of that garden per day of asparagus. Like these bastards grow, they grow fast. So we've, we've got to be agile about what we're doing with that. And it's not just sauteed asparagus. It, it, it's lovely. Don't get me wrong with, with one of the eggs from our garden with our, from our hens, gorgeous, but you know, you've got to skate that fine line of, of giving people something delicious and, and honest. But at the end of the day, you know, like we're a business, like I've, I've got to, I've got to justify why they're coming to us. Because if you get too simple, they they're not coming back. So I've got to over deliver on 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 our technique. Has this tree change that you've uh, taken? Has it changed you? Hundred percent. Yeah. We're just uh, I don't know. It's it's a it's a slower slower pace of life. When we're, we're more in tune with the seasons, I think now, and you can see four clear seasons up here. We're more in tune with the weather. Like we, we live, we, we didn't want to, um, do the tree change and like, you know, live in Cessnock or, you know, one, one of the Newcastle suburbs and I commute to work. We thought if we're doing it, we're going balls to the wall. We're going to live amongst the vineyards. So we do, we, uh, we live on Fordwich Hill, which is around the corner from our, our main vineyard where we've got 90 hectares of vines. We look out over vineyards and we look out over the, the Yengo National Park and we see the storms roll in and we see the storms roll out and 
you can smell the rain when it comes and you know it's it's um it w- without waxing lyrical about it too much it's it's what i was looking for you know i was i was looking for more of a connection to the land um which was becoming more and more evident in um my f- my food and and interests in the last few years of sydney cooking uh, and and even more so since the in-laws um, bought the farm, as they say. Yeah, my wife called me and she said, "Mum and Dad bought the farm," and I thought, "Oh, condolences, babe. You know we're going to miss them." And then she said, "No, they literally bought a farm." Uh, oh, okay. So, um, so yeah, we've been coming up here, and and we were just we were getting really into it, and you know since then we've we're not. We're not coming back. I'm not doing it. Huck. You can't make me. We're we're looking for something to buy up here, um, where where we love it. You know, we're, we're slowly starting to meet people in the community, and my son's nearly three now, and he's making little friends at daycare down the road, and it's it's all very nice. I feel very lucky. And I feel, um, you know, I'm not a religious man by any means, but it's it's hard not to feel blessed sometimes it really is well joey that's amazing to hear and very much looking forward to you doing what you do when uh, things open up again um, which isn't too far away i would love having you on deep in the weeds today to hear your story please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon i'd love to mate and and i really i really love what you do with all, all these programs it's it's so good i think i'm one of the the people uh, you know, I, I love shop talk. I love sitting down with my friends and just shop talk about restaurants and, and dining and food styles. And I can just go for a drive and, and switch on your dulcet tones and, you know, and, and it's, it's like a, a half hour shop talk whenever I want. And it's really fantastic. And I'm sure a lot of other people really appreciate everything you're doing, getting those stories out there. So well done to you too, mate. Thanks, Joey. Um, Keep in touch, mate, and um, we'll talk soon. Will do. Sounds good, Huck. Cheers. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.